Well, good evening or afternoon to everyone. My name is Jennifer McClendon. I am with the NOCC, National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, our Education and Missions Program Senior Manager here. And welcome to our Ask the Experts Facebook Live series, where we will be talking about genetics and family cancer syndromes. So this evening, I am honored to be joined today by Peggy Cottrell, a Certified Genetic Counselor and Genetics Program Manager at Charchera. And I'm also joined by Sue Friedman, Executive Director and Founder of FORCE, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with as well. So thank you so much to both of you for being here this afternoon with us. We look forward to learning so much more uh, from the both of you. So thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Sure. So if you've been following um, NOCC on social this last month, you'll notice that we've been talking a lot about genetics and family cancer syndromes all month long and talking about how genetics play a big role in whether or not we get cancer in some cases. And one important area of study that we know is um, talks about family cancer syndromes. And by studying these, hopefully one day, We'll hope to better understand why some families are more likely to get ovarian cancer and how we can ad address those in the future. So in our discussion today, we will take a closer look at genetics and family cancer syndrome so that we can better understand them. I, Before we get started, I would just like to give a moment of recognition and thank you to our dedicated partners, GSK and Merck, for supporting this critical education program. We really appreciate them. So let's just go ahead and get started and I'll start with the first question, because I think this first question, Peggy, kind of sets the stage for the whole discussion. But the, the question really is, is ovarian cancer inherited? And can you speak to that a little bit? Maybe start with a brief overview of what that looks like, that the role that genetics maybe play um, in this uh, important question. Is it inherited? Yes. So most of the time, probably ovarian cancer is not inherited and it happens just by chance. And sometimes there are exposures, things in the environment, lifestyle factors can all play a role, but chance plays a pretty big role as well. But probably about 10 to 15% of the time, maybe a little bit more, um, we see that there's something inherited predisposing to ovarian cancer. And there are two main syndromes that we talk about. The first is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And this is probably the most well-known. These are genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, PALB2, um, maybe ATM, where there's a combination of a family history of breast cancer, especially at young ages, ovarian cancer, sometimes pancreatic, sometimes prostate. And these mutations increase the risk for these kinds of cancer. Uh, the second hereditary syndrome that we see that's also just as common, but not as well known, is Lynch syndrome. Lynch. And Lynch syndrome is a pattern where we see mainly young colon cancer and endometrial cancer. But ovarian cancer occurs in Lynch syndrome as well. And so when you're looking at a family tree, you're not only looking to see how many cases of ovarian cancer there are, but you're looking for other types of cancer as well. Now there are genes that can predispose to a pattern of mainly ovarian cancer with maybe a little bit of breast cancer. Some of those genes are BRIP1 or RAD51C, RAD51D, um, and then some very rare syndromes with high risks for cancer as well. Um, and so I think what we want to start out by saying is that anybody who has ovarian cancer should be getting a genetic test. And it's not only because we want to know if there's something inherited, but it's also going to help guide the oncologist to knowing what kind of treatment someone should have. And that's really, really important. Those genetic test results. Absolutely. That's a good, good point. Um, thank you for covering that. Anything you'd like to add to that, Sue, yourself? I, you know, Peggy covered it really great. All yep. those genes we are, you know, these days when they do genetic testing, they can test for all of these genes at once. And mm -hmm. we are starting to see at force people with BRIP1, with RAD51 CND. Um, and, and I do think it's important to not just know if you have a syndrome, but to know what gene 
like which gene your mutation's in. So if you have genetic testing, it's important to get those results and understand what they mean and mm -hmm. which gene has the mutation. Exactly right. And I think you're going to hear throughout the discussion today how important it is to have a resource like Peggy, a genetic certified genetic counselor, to answer some of these questions because it, it can be really overwhelming. And that's one thing that I love about the FORCE website, too, is that if you if you know of a gene that you have in your family, you can go directly to that gene on your site and read all about it. It's very easy to understand. So we appreciate having that. <laughs> Thank but yes, and you mentioned hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Peggy. That's also called HBOC, right? Is that the short version of that? Just yes. wanted to make sure. Okay, HBOC and Lynch. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay, yeah. Um, so how would you, in these family cancers, I think you did actually touch on that. How would you actually recognize if you had a family cancer syndrome in your family? But I think you actually touched on that too, right? Having, it's, it, you know, the importance of having those discussions, right? Well, it's really important to talk with people in your family about who has cancer. And sometimes people, listen, people have things they want to keep their health private. Um, but if you care about your family, and most people do, you're going to want to let other people in the family know what's going on. And once you see this kind of pattern, then it can make sense to get the genetic testing done. Now, sometimes people get genetic testing done and it looks like there's something inherited in the family, but the results can still come back negative. And that's where it's really important to speak to a genetic counselor because we can try to really look closely at what's going on in the family. And it can sometimes be that there's something inherited, but it's something either that we don't know how to look for yet or a mutation in a gene that we know about, but a mutation that's hard to identify in this particular case. And so it's important to get guidance on all of these issues. Explained so well, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so leading into a little bit more particulars about genetic testing, so what should those with a family history or a known family syndrome do in this case? Is that where genetic testing comes into play? And I think you've actually covered that as well. But, um, you know, how to, you know, is that where this comes into play is, is if they do have one of these syndromes, they should definitely get that done. Yes. And so okay. I started out by talking about people with ovarian cancer and the importance right. of them being tested, but certainly people who don't have cancer but have a strong pattern in their family are also often covered to get the cost of genetic testing paid for by their insurance. And yeah. I'd like to always point out that the cost of genetic testing has come down significantly in the close to 25 years that I've been doing this kind of work. Oh, wow. And so it used to be, it would cost people several thousand dollars to get a genetic test. And nowadays, if people have insurance, I can find them a test um, really easily for a couple hundred dollars. Yep, I've heard the same thing. That's really great news. Really great news. I think a lot of people still believe it's expensive just because of the many years where it was. I know that, um, you know, when I had testing, it was in the thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, as the technology has gotten better, it's become less expensive and, and, more affordable. I did also want to comment, you know, I know we use the term syndromes and, and HBOC or hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And I know Peggy um, said this and talked about the other types of cancer. It's so important to know that um, you need to know about the cancer on both sides of your okay. family, your mother's side and the father's side. And you need to tell all your relatives, male and female, because these genes, you know, depending on the gene, but especially BRCA1 and 2 and Lynch syndrome genes, um, you know, the cancers do increase the risk in men and, and a lot of the other genes too. And it really varies by gene. Well, would you mind, Peggy, kind of taking us on a little walk about um, what that process looks like, the genetic testing process, what that looks like, and maybe some of those risks and benefits to think about? Because I know one of those that, you know, I'm sure you'll bring up is the psychological impact that that can have on individuals as well. I'm sure you counsel very many individuals on that exact topic, but could you talk about the process just a little bit? Yeah, so the process can really vary, and that's because nowadays you can get genetic testing in many places and not always with the assistance of a genetic counselor. 
True. Um, and so ideally, there's an informed consent that goes with this test. And it's important to talk through all of the pros and the cons of having the testing done and what the implications are for positive results. Um, I think the biggest pros of the test is it really puts you in a position to be able to understand what your risk is and to be able to make some of those important decisions about screening um, and the possibility of prophylactic surgery. Um, the cons, probably the biggest con is anxiety, but I wanna point out mm. that while there's a lot of anxiety around the test itself, and people generally feel very anxious after they first test positive, that studies show over time, there really isn't long-term anxiety that goes with being a carrier. And the anxiety comes in getting settled into those decisions. And once those tough decisions are made, generally people are become much more comfortable with what this means. Um, there are some concerns, not about medical insurance. It would be against the law for a medical insurance company to discriminate in any way because of a genetic finding. But it's still possible for other types of insurance like life or long-term care or uh, disability insurance to take into account not just genetic testing, but people's health um, when they're writing these kind of policies. But we want to remind people that taking care of health is more important than having excellent life insurance. Um, and very often people can get their life insurance in order before they go ahead and have the testing done. Sorry about that, Peggy. I was also going to add, there are some states where they cannot discriminate against you um, for life insurance coverage, um, but it's really very few, but it's important to, and another reason to see your genetic counselor because they yeah. frequently know the state laws too around, um, right. you know, genetic privacy laws and um, and any other protections. Yep. In addition to actually, you know, what your results actually mean and having that along good with counseling. everything else they know. Yeah. With... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you for for covering that too. In addition to genetic uh, testing, what, you know, can you maybe speak, maybe either of you, on what other things those you know individuals who have a genetic mutation or have a known family cancer syndrome like HBOC or Lynch, other things that they can do to possibly reduce their risk? So I think the first thing to know is that we do a totally different kind of screening for people who are at high risk. Um, and I will start by saying that there is no good screening for ovarian cancer. And so when we're talking about a risk of ovarian cancer, we're always thinking about something to do related to a procedure. And so sometimes people need to have their ovaries and tubes taken out um, before cancer can develop. Sometimes we want to take out just the tubes from people who may not have a very high risk. We know that Oftentimes, ovarian cancer starts in the tubes, and that can be a discussion uh, to consider as well. But we should not rely on screening for ovarian cancer, not a transvaginal ultrasound and not a CA125 blood test. But in terms of breast cancer, we have tools that improve our ability to find cancer early in high-risk women. And the main one is a breast MRI and people who test positive um, generally become eligible to have that covered by their insurance. And that's an important um, option to consider. For right. people with Lynch syndrome, similarly, um, instead of being covered typically nowadays, a colonoscopy starting around age 45 and then every five to 10 years, depending, uh, for people with Lynch syndrome, they start much younger, somewhere between 25 and 35, depending on the gene that's involved. There are uh, several genes that are implicated in Lynch syndrome, and they vary a little bit one from another. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then that colonoscopy is done every year or two instead of every five years. Um, we find with Lynch syndrome that polyps can change much more quickly from being just a, 
a plain polyp to being cancer. And that's why it's so important to know about Lynch because it gives you the opportunity to make sure that you get those polyps out before they um, That's really good to know. That's really good to know that those can change due to having that syndrome. They can change often quicker. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, if, if I can add uh, just a couple of other things too. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there are guidelines, national guidelines that are developed by experts based on your gene mutation if you have one and so it is that's oh, where it's important. so it's not just you know every person with lynch syndrome has the same recommendations at the same age so there are age differences depending on the gene so you know again it is important to know which gene your mutations and if you have a known mutation and of course your genetics expert your genetic counselor will be able to assist you um, with that and direct you to the national guidelines and i know you mentioned jennifer that you know on the force website we do have um, gene by gene information based on the latest guidelines i also wanted to mention one other thing and that is there are several clinical trials looking at new approaches to um, managing ovarian cancer risk um, one you know peggy had talked about taking the tubes out for people who aren't at extremely high risk. Um, there are studies looking at it as an approach, potentially, we don't know if it lowers risk yet. So, you know, it's really important to know that um, we do know removing the ovaries and tubes lowers risk um, for ovarian cancer and high risk individuals enough to help them live longer. Um, but we don't know that about removing the tubes only, but there are some studies looking at that one, a big study called SOROC, um, that's right. looking at that. If it, we remove the tubes and wait and remove the ovaries later when women are closer to menopause, um, can we lower the risk without putting them into, um, a, you know, immediate surgical menopause? But we don't know that yet. So if you're thinking about it, I would recommend, you know, seeing if you can find a clinical trial um, so that, you know, you can be studied and watched closely long term. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, before we kind of come to the ending few questions that we have, we did have one question that came through the um, online uh, chat here, and I just wondered if I could ask that question. So um, an individual is asking, they have the BRIP1 mutation and wondered if you could maybe speak a little bit to that, or is there anything there, a key takeaway or highlight from that that you could speak on? Um, a mutation in BRIP1 doesn't increase the risk of ovarian cancer as much as BRCA1 and BRCA2, but it increases an, it enough to recommend um, considering a prophylactic surgery to remove the ovaries and tubes. Um, it probably can be done at a later age, and I would you know, recommend that um, you check with an expert. I would have to just double check mm -hmm. on the uh, uh, NCCN guidelines, the age recommendation. It's probably either 40 to 45 or 45 to 50, something like that. Um, there may be, but not clear if there's an increased risk for breast cancer with BRIP1 as well. Okay. And so you wanna use guidance of family history. So sometimes mm. people um, test positive for BRIP1 and there's no one in the family who's had breast cancer. And then you can probably um, continue um, screening as you have been. Um, but if there were a fair amount of breast cancer in the family, then you might be eligible for a breast MRI like you would be with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, oh, wonderful. And there are a couple of studies that are open to people with BRIP1 mutations who have not had ovarian cancer. One is called WISP2 slash TUBA. So it has two names. Um, and they're looking at, you know, again, this is a study, so we don't know if removing the fallopian tubes only followed by removal of the ovaries later in life can lower the risk for ovarian cancer. And then I think there's another study that's looking for an, trying to look for an early detection for ovarian cancer called the MIDE study, M-I-D-E. Um, and uh, there may be other studies, but those are two that we actually have on the, the FORCE website. Great. 
Well, thank you. That was a, a great information on RIP1 I didn't know about. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, if anyone watching has any questions for our experts, feel free to put those in. But I'd like to ask, you know, I think I know what you might say, but what would be maybe your number one or number two takeaway from the discussion we've had today about genetics and family cancer syndromes? You know, if if you don't mind, just something before I forget. Of course, that didn't of course. Touch on that I think is really important too, because right now FORCE has a survey for um, individuals at high risk for breast and ovarian cancer, and we've had over a thousand respondents. But one Wonderful. of the things that is, it's incredible. But um, something like six hundred people who responded because and said they were at high risk for um, gynecologic cancers. We asked them, has any healthcare professional ever discussed? the symptoms of gynecologic cancer and 60% said no. And although, you know, we know that ovarian cancer symptoms are um, fairly nonspecific um, and we know that there's not a great early detection, it is a cancer that has syndrome, uh, that has symptoms. And, yes. you know, a long time ago, like I don't remember when, you know, I've been doing this 25 years too, Peggy. You have. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I remember that, you know, there was some really um, important landmark studies that showed that, you know, women with ovarian cancer did have consistent um, symptoms. And so it really is important if, um, and I would have to also look them up. I know we have them on the FORCE website. I'm guessing NOC has it on your website and sure share it too, but it's really important to know what the symptoms are and report any abnormal, um, you know, persistent symptoms um, to your healthcare professional. Yeah. And I know a lot of women, including myself, tend to overlook some of those symptoms, you know, because it could be related to so many things. But like you said, you know, it's just one of those things. But I, you know, be an advocate for yourself and bring those things up. It's never a, a bad idea for sure. Thanks for pointing that out for sure. Yeah. Um, a takeaway from you, Peggy. Um, I would just like to say uh, a couple things. One, that if you have either ovarian cancer or a close family history of ovarian cancer, you're a good candidate for a genetic test. And yeah. um, that's something you can certainly look into. Um, and um, if you are... Um, yeah, thought went out of my head, but so that's, oh, that's number okay. one. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And number two is just being aware and um, talking with your family about these things and mm -hmm. um, knowing about your family history. And finally, that the cost of genetic testing is lower and insurance is becoming much more likely to cover. Um, and finally, okay. if you um, if you have questions and you wish you could talk to a genetic counselor, you can uh, be in touch with us at Charcharit. People can set up a half an hour to ask questions to me. I can't order anyone a genetic test in my role at Charcharit, but I'm able to provide um, guidance um, about the particulars of whatever it is you're struggling with. Wonderful. I think that goes great along with one of the questions that just came in, Peggy, was um, the question is, is it worth talking to a genetic counselor if you've already had genetic testing for ovarian cancer diagnosis and received counseling from your doctor's office? For She says, for example, um, they tested positive for a BRCA mutation and I'm already receiving increased breast cancer screening. So is it worth, even though they've gone through all of that, to go ahead and still talk to a genetic counselor? And I so I think what happens when you're a carrier of one of these mutations is the issues change with age. And so at the beginning, mm -hmm. the concern is really about getting started on breast cancer screening, and that's really important. Sure. And as one gets a little bit older, it starts to be important to think about the risk for ovarian cancer. And when is one going to think about removing the ovaries and tubes? Um, another question that comes up for people who may have tested already is what does this mean for my children? And yeah. I think it's one of the most difficult things for women to deal with. Some women would rather have another surgery than to have to think about what it means to have passed something like this to their kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another thing. We have tools that can help people speak more easily about these issues with their kids. Um, and yeah. so all of these things that can come up 
um, maybe happened years after you originally tested and originally spoke to either a doctor or to a genetic counselor. Um, and at Chershire, we can help you work through those things. And again, I don't usually talk to people for more than about 20 or 30 minutes, but just some guidance about any guidance, of yeah. issues can help people uh, get on the right track. And we have um, peer supporters. So if you want to, this is not my life experience, uh, BRCA, um, but we have lots of callers who are happy to talk about a variety of issues. And then we have some resources. We have something we call a mastectomy kit, which just has some tips about surgery, um, a garment to help hold the drains, a cushion to use in the car with the seat belt. Um, we have something we call a prophylactic busy box for women with young children that has parenting resources and toys to help entertain children while mom is busy recovering. Yeah. So some great resources that are available. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the everything we offer at Charcher is free of charge. Wonderful. I, I would like to follow up to first to the question of, you know, should someone see a genetic counselor if they haven't? And, and I would say yes. I mean, um, even if you spoke to a doctor, unless they were a geneticist um, and that was mm -hmm. their expertise, it's very hard for healthcare professionals in other fields to also stay up to date on, That's right. um, on <laughs> genetics. Yeah. And then, um, you know, Charcher, it has great resources and so does FORCE. Um, you know, we also have a peer navigation program. We refer a lot of people to share, share it mm -hmm. too, because, you know, you guys do such a great job. Um, and especially for that, you know, the individual support and genetic support. Um, and so I would say, you know, visit both of the websites, see about the resources that are there um, and, you know, reach out to us if you need us. And no one should have to deal with these issues alone. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing your, your wonderful resources there too. Yeah. Um, we have a few on our, our site as well on how to of talk course. to your family. <laughs> to, no tips for the talk. Um, but they all play all the, you know, all of the resources combined together play so well with each other. So you're, you're not without the resources that you need. That's for sure. <laughs> um, another question came in, if you don't mind, um, this question is, can you clarify if there is an age that you would recommend a son to get tested if there is a BRCA mutation in the family, a known mutation in the family? I thought that was so, an interesting question. Yeah, so there are a couple things to think about. First, from the first point of view, thinking about when men start screening for cancers that can occur with BRCA, probably mm -hmm. not until close to 35 or 40. But I want to point out that sometimes people who have these mutations want to use some kind of in vitro fertilization with screening of em embryos to avoid passing the mutation to the next generation. Oh. That's not something that's required or even recommended, but that's available. And so I think very often it's important for people who are being tested um, or people who, to find out about testing at a time before they're planning to have kids in case that would be something they would want to take into account. Okay, thank you. Um, well, another question has come in. <laughs> um, and this is one that we get questions about quite often as well. Are those variants of unknown significance, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that? So um, they said, Peggy, thank you so much for sharing the wonderful information um, about variants of unknown significance or VUS. Could you speak to what they are and how to navigate those a little bit? Yes. So a variant of uncertain significance means that the lab has found something that's a little bit different than what most people have. Yeah. So they're not sure that it's a negative result because it's different, but they're not sure if it's a positive result because the change to the protein is not necessarily significant. Hmm. And so these are really difficult to deal with because you're left with you know, you go into a genetic test thinking that you're going to learn something definitive about your risk and you end up finding something that makes you feel like you're mm -hmm. maybe even worse off than where you started. 
So it's really important to talk to a genetic counselor when you have one of these. Sometimes we can look up on public databases to see if there are th these uncertain variants change in terms of what the recommendations um, might be. Most of the time they're reclassified to being more likely benign, but sometimes mm -hmm. they are reclassified to being mutations. And this happened um, a couple of years ago to someone famous, um, Chris Everett, the tennis player. And she had a, a sister who died of ovarian cancer. And her sister had one of these uh, VUS on certain variants. Um, her variant was reclassified and uh, after she was deceased, but um, Chris Everett was notified, was tested, tested positive. Um, and during prophylactic surgery to remove her ovaries was diagnosed with an early stage ovarian cancer. Early stage. Wow. Wow. That's a great. So that's an amazing story. Right. Um, we did a webinar um, about a year and a half ago about uncertain variants and it's Wonderful. Um, archived on our webpage if people are interested in learning more about it. Wonderful. Great. Wonderful explanation. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I think that's all the questions we've had, we've had coming through so far. Um, this has been very informative. Uh, this is this Ask the Expert series is designed to just be a quick bite. And I think you've both done a really great job. Thank you so much for kind of going through these two that sometimes can be confusing topics together. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your experience and for being with us here to uh, this, e this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you. But thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. This again will be posted um, on NOCC's YouTube page and we'll be sharing this out. So if you know of anyone else that would benefit from this information, please do share. And our next Access the Experts will be in June, June 27th, where we'll be doing a deep dive on the findings from this year's SGO conference by our very own Dr. Michael Bookman. So mark down June 27th and we're excited to have that one soon. But thank you again. And with that, we will conclude. Thank you so much.